OK, so thank you for staying all the way to the last presentation. So actually, this year, it's not going to be so technical, so mathematical as last year or the previous year. <laughs> it's going to be a bit of, uh, of a summary of, of what we're using, uh, why we're using software-defined radio in the lab, and especially how it enables experiments that you would not be able to do without software-defined radio. So it's, that's a bit the outline. So at the moment, if you look a bit in the literature, I, I was just looking at, at the latest uh, uh, articles in the review of scientific instruments. It seems like every scientist or everyone who's doing software-defined radio is, has to publish uh, either a network analyzer or a locking amplifier or whatever, whatever you want. It's, uh, basically, at the moment, you see that more and more software-defined radio are getting into some, uh, some of these experiments, actually some, some quite fancy experiments. Um, so what actually what kind of uh, scientific instrument would I address with software-defined radio? It, of course, this is not exhaustive. It's just the kind of topic that we address in our lab. Uh, everything that's related to radio frequency signals. So that's uh, spectral analyzers, uh, vector network analyzers. Basically, here you've got very basic instruments. But what I'm going to tell you later is whenever you use one of these lab equipments, some of your colleagues, if you leave your instrument for too long on an experiment, someone will say, this is not used. I can take it. And you know that at some point, your experiment is going to be dismantled because someone needs the instrument. So with software and fair radio, you're the only one to know how to use your stuff. So no one's going to steal it from you. Um, <laughs> But more seriously than locking detectors, that's uh, improvement of, 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 uh, of, of bandwidth. I don't know if you, if you read a uh, scientific journal like Physics Today, but every time in Physics Today, you've got the first advertisement. So Stanford Instruments showing we have analog locking amplifier. And just on the page uh, afterwards, you've got Zurich Instruments saying we've got this full uh, digital locking amplifier. And everyone is, of, of course, saying mine is better. Stanford says we have lower noise level. D uh, Zurich says we have higher bandwidth. And, and so depending on what you need. So beautiful thing with software and radio, you tune your hardware to your needs. And then I'm going to show you a bit about basic physics and scanning probe microscopy. I couldn't find the reference. There is, I know there is a published uh, magnetic force microscope that's been done with uh, uh, USRP, but I couldn't find the reference when preparing this. So actually, as I was starting this uh, presentation, my original presentation, you remember maybe a, a couple of years ago, I presented uh, passive radar. So when I was uh, visiting in Japan at uh, Professor Sato's laboratory in Sendai, I discovered how you can use uh, oscilloscope for doing uh, radar measurement because you've got a broadband uh, radio frequency receiver. So now most uh, radio uh, oscilloscope will have two 5 gigahertz bandwidth. So this, this uh, Roden Schwarz uh, must be 5 gigahertz bandwidth, 2.5 gigahertz. Uh, 2. 5, uh, sorry, 5 gigahertz bandwidth uh, measurement. And uh, initially, I was uh, playing with my colleagues, trying to do some, some, some software for acquisition. But uh, it took me a bit of time to make some usable uh, new radio interface for oscilloscope. So now uh, what we're looking at is collecting data from the oscilloscope. So you know that the schedule of new radio is working with kilobyte packets. All of these oscilloscopes have mega sample memory depth. So what we're doing is we're collecting a big chunk of data. And of course, for an experiment, you don't claim to be continuously streaming data. You just need chunks of data. But if you have high bandwidth measurement, you still can do quite a few other things. And the obvious uh, presentation beyond radar is uh, time of flight measurement. So time of flight measurement is measuring length of coaxial cables. So here we have our software defined radio source. Of course, you cannot treat it, but we've got the four channels from the oscilloscope. And these four channels are uh, uh, fed by a noise generator. This noise generator is the reference signal. And if you correlate uh, this noise uh, source with uh, the uh, received copies on the other channels, you've got the time delay. So you see here 177 nanosecond, 187 nanosecond, 202 nanosecond. And that's actually the time of flight in my 2 meter or 3 meter coaxial uh, cable. So uh, very easy uh, range resolution is uh, velocity of light in coaxial cable, 200 meters per microsecond, divided by twice the bandwidth. If we have something like a gigahertz bandwidth, we have 15 centimeter resolution. If we have 5 gigahertz bandwidth, we get 3 centimeter resolution. So uh, that's one of the classical ways of measuring uh, 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 defective uh, optical fiber or coaxial cable. So another obvious application which does not need continuous streaming is uh, displaying the spectrum. So when you're just displaying the spectrum, you want to know what, who is sending information on, on the channel. You don't need for it necessarily to, uh, to, to, to decode uh, this information. And here, the upper limit is given by the bandwidth of, of your oscilloscope. The lower limit is given by the sampling size. So if, for example, if you have a 2.5 gigahertz sample per second, oscilloscope and you have an 8,000 8, uh, Fourier transform, then you start at uh, 
60 ki 600 kilohertz. So that's, that's the kind of application that's easily ap applicable. And of course, the drawback of this radio frequency oscilloscope is there is very low number of bits. They claim 12 bit resolution. Uh, if you can get 10 bit NOB, you're already uh, good. And so this uh, limits the ratio of the strongest signal to the weakest signal that you can detect. So that's one of the big drawbacks of your software defined radio with respect to analog front ends. So uh, actually, so this, this, start, this work was started a couple of years ago. And uh, in the meantime, as I was getting ready to uh, publish some of the presentations, Marcus released New Radio 3.8. So everything that I did on 3.7 had to be started again. Uh, <laughs> and so it took another six months. <laughs> uh, so basically, what, what is this uh, GR oscilloscope uh, out of three modules that we released uh, is uh, a demonstration, an example of how to interface new radio with uh, other communication in this example, uh, other communication protocol. In, the, in this example, I'm using VXI, which is a GPIB over Ethernet. And uh, the user configurable uh, oscilloscope allows you to tune IP address, sample rate, measurement duration, variable number of sources. So basically, I take this as a, as a tutorial. So first of all, a tutorial on how to write an OOT block. And uh, now it has become, uh, so actually, it's just been released in the, for the French reading audience, it's just been released in the, in the latest Linux magazine. Uh, I take it also as, as a, a tutorial on how to translate a, a new radio 3.7 out of, out, out, out of three module to a new radio 3.8. Uh, as I was about to upload the English translation of the article, I realized that I had not uplo updated to the 3.8. So if anyone is interested, I'll be happy to translate it at the moment on the website, on the FOSDEM uh, site, you only have the French version of, of the manuscript. So why would you even bother looking at an oscilloscope as, as a radio frequency source? So this is actually what, uh, the experiment that happened to us as, as we're playing with the oscilloscope in Japan is uh, we had sent, uh, at, at the time we were not using a random uh, generator, we were just using a sine wave, and the sine wave was collected by two channels. And you think that when you buy one of these high-grade oscilloscopes, if they claim that the two channels are synchronous, well, they must be synchronous, and this is absolutely not the case. If you look at the phase between these two channels, of course, uh, this is an 800 megahertz signal fed to a 10 gigahertz oscilloscope, so we have about a ratio of 1 to 10 between sampling frequency and carrier frequency. Well, sometimes you see some of these jumps, so even someone as clever as Agilent uh, has some missing packets or some missing data uh, between their multiple channels. So actually, the funny thing is we realized we did not have these kind of jumps between channel 1 and 4, but with, between channel 1 and 2, we are losing some, some samples. Don't ask me why. But that's way, that's way out of why is it? Gigahertz. Sorry, uh, I must have mis mis misspelled. This is a 10 gigahertz oscilloscope with an 800 megahertz oscilloscope uh, sorry, sound wave output. Uh, these are experimental. And actually, this is not. This is one that I captured. But this, I mean, this is the kind of thing that you see jumping. Uh, if you trigger on, on the phase, you see this jumping every like one every once every second. It's not periodic, but uh, you see if you're doing radar and you're doing coherent measurements where you want to do di direction of arrival, if every second your phase is jumping, of course, you're going to have trouble uh, collecting this kind of information. So again, this is the kind of data that we collected. Oscilloscope source. Uh, either you do the Hilbert transform to get the complex. Uh, 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 output which gives you a phase and magnitude or you take the Fourier transform and multiply conjugate to correlate and in both cases of course we have co consistent phase jumps because it's really physically your, your oscilloscope that is missing some, some, some samples. So that was the first step and then I thought okay let's try to show a little bit what we're doing with other front ends. So doesn't this look to you like a coherent four channel locking detector? Uh, I mean, I to take two B210s, I take the one PPS uh, to try to lock their inputs, and as long as I keep on continuously streaming the data to not to lose the phase condition, then I have here a four-channel locking, uh, 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 locking detector, but with the added advantage that I don't have to go for VXI or GPIB to collect data, I have streaming data. So what I'm going to show you later is that the bandwidth, the communication bandwidth, of course, I have, I, in a lock-in, I'm doing a very narrow measurement, but because the data are streamed quite quickly, so I can do some, some nice measurements. Of course, I've got the flexibility, which I'm not going to convince this audience, that I can tune the, 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 the functionalities of my instrument uh, depending on my needs. Um, and here in the example of a, of a Pluto SDR here, 
Uh, this is something that we're using in the lab, but in our lab we're doing some, uh, some, some time transfer, or sorry, some, I should say some frequency transfer between high stability oscillators. So if you try to create uh, uh, feedback loops uh, using a crappy uh, temperature control crystal oscillators and you're trying to lock two uh, atomic clocks, that's not going to work very well. So in this example, for example, we can clock the Pluto SDR from hydrogen maser. Unfortunately, hydrogen maser generate 10 and 100 megahertz signal and somehow when you plot the phase noise of your Pluto SDR or your AD9363, you realize that you need to, to feed it something above 40 megahertz. So maximum seems to be 60 megahertz. I'm not exactly sure of the specs, but 80 megahertz yeah. top, but below, it, it starts working at 10 megahertz, but between 10 and 40 megahertz, you have a very poor or degraded phase noise, so you cannot just take the hydrogen maser, you need to trick a little bit of the, the synthesis, but uh, you feed it with your 40 megahertz uh, input, and then you can uh, do some sort of, of feedback loop on your, on your uh, control. So this is the kind of thing that software-defined radio allows you to do. So if, if, I, if I take a, just an oscilloscope or actually any rod and Schwarz instrument, uh, well, actually rod and Schwarz is not a good example because I can, I can feed it with a 10 megahertz external clock, but oscilloscope, I've never seen an oscilloscope which I could give external clock to, uh, to, to, to clock my a to D converters. So here is an example of a practical demonstration. I'm not doing, I'm not the guy doing the, the, the frequency transfer. Um, you're all using quartz. Quartz is a little piece of material that creates the rate at which your microprocessor is clocked. And if you take a quartz, actually it's kind of funny that uh, 300 years ago, your clock was, uh, uh, the, the, the time uh, of a second was, was defined by the motion of, 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 this, uh, of your clock. And actually today, your frequency is still given by the thickness of a piece of quartz between which you put your two electrodes. And everyone will go to Farnell, buy a quartz, and say, if I just put the right capacitor, it will oscillate at 8 megahertz. I just want to show you here that it oscillates at 8 or 16 megahertz because there's been a huge body of work in tuning the shape of these uh, surfaces, of tuning the electrodes. This is just uh, a device that a, a colleague of mine gave me to characterize the acoustic mode. This is the kind of thing of, I, I do for, for as research, uh, you can map the acoustic field. So remember, it's an electrical component from your perspective. It's just an electrical dipole. But the physics is that actually it's a piece of quartz vibrating. And I'm going to show you later how you, how you measure this. But this is the electrode. And if I look at the field of displacement, I can detect the magnitude of the displacement and the phase of the displacement. And if you're not careful in the way you pattern the electrodes on your piece of quartz, on top here, you've got the spectrum. So that's the uh, uh, real part of the admittance. And all these peaks are the various modes. So if you were just to put this on a microprocessor or microcontroller um, uh, feedback loop, well, you would just wouldn't know if it starts on 445, on 465 megahertz. It, it would just start on one of these modes. And actually, I like this picture because it shows you that on, on, on low frequency modes, it's not really very exciting. You've got this shape, you've got this shape. But when you start looking at high frequency modes, uh, sorry, this is a frequency, so this is 5 megahertz. Uh, there you go to 8 megahertz, you start seeing this is a different propagation mode. But then when you go to 12 megahertz, you start seeing some beautiful patterns. So this is all the, all the standing waves that you can find on a, on a piece of course. And then, of course, the higher the frequency, the higher the modes and, and the, the, the nicer the patterns. So how do you collect this kind of, of, of data? Uh, that's uh, your scan so basics of scanning probe microscopy. Um, actually, we've got an expert on scanning probe microscopy here in front. So scanning probe microscopy is the idea that you have a scalar probe, and for each position of your sample, you collect a measurement. And then you move a little bit your sample, collect a new information. So you only have a, a, a single probe, and it's because you move the sample under your probe that you can map the physical quantity. In this particular case, the physical quantity that we're interested in is the out-of-plane motion of a piece of quartz. And how do you measure an out-of-plane motion? You make an interferometer. So an interferometer is you send the laser, you split the laser, you illuminate your sample, you compare the, time, the, the distance between the reference arm. So actually, in, part, in this particular case, the ref reference arm is given by the reflection of a laser in front of this uh, helium neon. It's not the right way of doing it, but that's how we do it. And then you look at the reflected signal and this reflected signal will be at a phase which is dependent on the path difference between this part and this part. 
if you just, uh, anyone, anyone who's done basic physics courses and who's assembled the Michelson interferometers know that this fringe pattern is extremely sensitive to environment. If you just uh, heat a bit of the air, if you just blow a little bit some, some hot air in front of a reference arm, you're going to see the fringe moving. So if we were to do this kind of measurement with a basic Michelson interferometer, we would have a, a static phase varying. So what we do is we frequency shift from baseband to radio frequency band using an acousto-optic modulator. And this acousto-optic modulator is clocked at 80 megahertz. This is a narrow band device. So we send the laser, the laser is modulated at 80 megahertz, it goes to the sample, comes, goes back to the acoustical optic modulator, so 2 times 80 megahertz, 160 megahertz, and this is what is going to the radio frequency detector, which is a high frequency photodiode. So this is the basics of heterodyne approach. If you don't understand the basic physics of what I just mentioned, just remember that what you get here is 160 megahertz, twice the acoustical optic modulator uh, frequency, plus your acoustic device here, and typically this will be a quartz at 16 megahertz, for example. So you intrinsically have a radio frequency measurement here. And what you want is to collect these two channels, the reference channel and the measurement channel, using uh, one of these, uh, uh, one of these uh, uh, signal processing systems. So we heard multiple times 0MQ. I just want to emphasize we use zero, uh, I fell in love with 0MQ uh, when I was in Japan because I, I could separate what new radio was for, which is collecting streaming radio frequency data, and what someone else was doing, in this case it will be new octave, which is asynchronous operations. In this case, for example, I want to steer an antenna or I want to move this position under the sample. That's not the job of new radio. New radio is streaming radio frequency data. It has other things to do than to program a positioner to tell it to move to a new position. So what we're doing here is we have a B210. This B210 is collecting on two channels radio frequency signals. We want to know the ratio of the reference channel, of the measurement channels to the reference channel. So we divide these devices, low pass filter because we have far too many samples per second. And we stream this data to a first zero MQ sync. And then I would like to make sure that my experiment is working properly, so I want to get the magnitude of each one of these channels just to make sure that my signal to noise ratio is sufficient. So I take these two magnitudes, low pass again, flow to complex, and these two complex, of course, it's not real and imaginary, but it's two magnitudes, I stream to a second 0MQ stream. And these two 0MQ streams are sent to GNU Octave, and GNU Octave will make the best on the one hand of 0MQ, on the other hand of the instrument control. Uh, new Octave provides functionalities for communicating RS-232, GPIB, all these common communication modes. So in this particular case, my, zero, my uh, instrument control uh, will talk through a serial port to this positioner, so this uh, uh, positioning system that moves my sample under the probe, the laser probe, so I can just send messages. And that's, again, I think not the job of new radio to stop its streaming uh, activity to send commands to a positioner that is moved once every second. And then as my new octave has moved the positioner, I open a socket, a, a zero MQ socket. So actually, since I have two streams, I have to open two zero MQ sockets in a published subscribe that's uh, analogous to uh, um, UDP. So either data are, are sunk and good, I process them, or they're just lost, but there is no uh, TCP IP transaction. So I subscribe to, to my socket. I collect data because zero MQ is sending kilobytes uh, size. If you want more than a few kilobytes, you need to collect multiple sockets, uh, multiple packets. And the only way I found to make sure that I'm synchronous between my positional motion and my zero MQ stream is to close the socket and, and open it again when I'm at a new position. So in this example, for each position X and Y, I collect 20 radio frequency samples. And what's really important to me is I never stop the radio frequency stream because the B210, if I have two B210, they start being synchronous, but you don't know what is the phase offset. So if at some point I stop the stream and I start it again, I start with a new phase offset and I cannot uh, compensate for it. So in, here, in this case, I keep on streaming uh, radio frequency data and, it's, and, and at least if I calibrate my phase offset, I know it's the same throughout the, the data I collect. So this is a kind of experimental setup we have. If you take your basic experiment, you're gonna see what it looked like initially. Um, you had uh, this positioner, so this is, uh, well, when I, what I call positioner is this little 
uh, sliding stage is you've got one in X, one in Y, and you want to position the sample with uh, sub-micrometer uh, accuracy. So it actually takes a bit of time for the servo to settle. Actually, what you realize, it takes about 10 milliseconds for the servo to settle. So when you have this positioning system, you've got this laser beam. Laser beam is illuminating uh, the sample through this optical microscope uh, lens here. And if you take general purpose instruments, remember what I needed is two magnitudes to make sure that my signal to noise ratio is good and one phase information from a locking amplifier. If you do this with uh, general purpose lab grade instruments, you need four uh, GPIB communication. That takes about one second per sample uh, to stream data. And if you have about 100 by 100 samples, that's 10,000 seconds. So you just uh, wait for about three hours because your GPIB communication is so slow. Even over VXI 11, even, even if you do Ethernet, it's the intrinsic. Uh, here you have to trigger the measurement, collect the measurement, fetch the measurements, and start again. So you see here we start with 10,000 seconds for one measurement. If you go to streaming from uh, new radio, from soft software different radio, you remove the bottleneck. You're only at 10 milliseconds per sample. So you see that you go from 10,000 seconds to about 15 minutes. So here is where software different radio enables something that would not be done previously. It's high throughput data. But then you see that these 10 milliseconds they're not really related to streaming the data. It's just because I'm wasting time waiting for this projector to settle. So what about removing the positioner and moving the optical beam? So what we did is we removed the positioner that takes 10 milliseconds to settle, and we just put two rotating mirrors. And these rotating mirrors, they have very small inertia. So they will move at 100 hertz. Instead of 10 milliseconds uh, for settling each position, I can get a whole line in 10 milliseconds. And there you see that you take the best out of a streaming of software-defined radio because now you're not wasting, you're just limited by the data stream for the software-defined radio. Notice that we started with 10,000 seconds per measurement and we reached two seconds per measurement. This is what I call what you could not do without software-defined radio. With 10,000 second measurements, my colleagues were starting an experiment, leaving the lab in the evening, and they would collect the data the next day. Now I can tune my experiments, I can focus, I can change the focal length here just by looking at the output of the images because it's, re it's refre refreshed every two seconds. So here is what I'm, I'm calling enabling experiments that would not be done otherwise. And again, you see here, uh, this is one of the vibration mode of your course where you've got uh, one node and, and, and two maximum uh, amplitude displacement, which are out of phase. So it's actually a motion that, that looks like this on, on my piece of quartz. Uh, and this is actually what you gain from software different radio. Initial experiment was actually the, the locking amplifier has already been stolen by someone. You had two spectrum analyzer, you have a network analyzer, and all this stuff is replaced by an E310 here because I wanted to be uh, completely autonomous and uh, a couple of passive uh, radio frequencies. So uh, when presented to you the OSKIM digital framework, all this stuff here has been uh, uploaded on the OSKIM digital and where we upload our custom firmware is in triggering the measurement from the E310, so the stream is triggered by an external signal, and this is the novelty where we change the uh, original firmware to have external trigger of, of the data stream. Uh, to conclude this presentation, another thing that we're doing is pulse radar. Pulse radar is, I'll go very quickly, quickly through it, but again, uh, here software defined radio allows you to sequence uh, pulses using uh, an updated firmware. In this case, it's a red pitaya. The red pitaya is taking care of sequencing all the, uh, sequ uh, all the pulses needed for radar signal. Transposition to a uh, radio frequency band is done by uh, feeding a switch with uh, a voltage control oscillator and an IQ demodulator. Of course, the red pitaya is only care taking care of baseband, and this is the kind of of uh, processing stream that we have in the red pitaya generating the various uh, start offset, pulse stop offset to generate the pulses that will be streaming uh, pulse uh, uh, radar. So in this example, we can have a radar system with a pulse repetition rate of about 250 kilohertz, and this is again the kind of uh, update rate that would not be feasible with an oscilloscope uh, collecting data to be processed. And why would you need such a high pulse repetition rate? In this particular case, we are probing uh, acoustic sensors, so these are 
uh, radio frequency sensors acting as cooperative targets. What kind of sensor would need 250 kilo sample per second? Well, actually, vibration sensor. If you're looking at strain gauge, uh, in this case, we have a strain gauge glued to a tuning fork. And if you hit the tuning fork with a, with a hammer, of course, you've got the 440 hertz main mode. But thanks to the high sampling frequency, you can see modes up to 40 kilohertz. Our bandwidth is up to 125 kilo sample per second. Now, I'm not saying that pulse radar is the right way of doing a radar. Of course, frequency swept radar are much more elegant and much more beautiful. But a, f a frequency swept radar or a correlated radar with noise radar will never achieve 250 kilohertz uh, update rate. Only pulse radar, to my knowledge, will achieve such high pulse repetition rate. So in this particular case, where we wanted high measurement bandwidth, we went for this pulse radar approach. And finally, to the, the last presentation, uh, the last demonstration is phase noise measurement. Phase noise is the characteristics of uh, the stability. So if you remember that phase is the integral of the frequency, if you look at the phase fluctuation of your oscillator over a given bandwidth, so that's phase fluctuation over one hertz uh, bin size, then you characterize how your oscillator, how stable your oscillator is. So let's say you have a reference oscillator, you have a device under test, you don't care about the carrier, you just want to know what is happening around the carrier. So you need to mix it. And because this guy is going to continuously move with respect to this guy, you need a feedback to control uh, and, and keep your reference oscillator uh, running after the device under test. This is your analog approach to cancel uh, the carrier. It's got a lot of problems. Uh, my colleagues are experts in this. You've got fluctuations due to the, to the mixer here. So we do a digital approach. So it's exactly the same story. We collect A, we collect B, no feedback loop. After A to D conversion, everything is digital. So no bias, no drift. We have the mixer with a local oscillator, digital implementation. Uh, decimation, arc tangent, unwrapping, uh, linear regression, Fourier transform, and we send uh, the phase uh, fluctuation. So this is actually what, the, what, what we do with uh, E310, uh, the X310. Uh, unfortunately, X310 always got two times two A to D converter. It can only stream complex values, so we need um, two uh, X310 to do this, this kind of measurement. And here, again, is what we implement in the X310 uh, to get this kind of phase. So the, the curve here looks smooth. Uh, it, it, it's actually very uh, consistent with professional hardware from Agilent or Roden Schwartz. And what you have here is the phase fluctuation as a function of the offset to the, to the carrier frequency. So again, this is a kind of measurement where you have a 50K instrument from Roden Schwartz or Agilent, which is pretty well implemented with uh, two uh, USRP here. So uh, just to show you a little bit what we're doing in our custom hardware. And the, what I would like to emphasize is all these guys here uh, we did a presentation last year at the uh, International Frequency Control Symposium. Uh, if you look at the road and Schwarz system, they will hide all of these for you. So whatever is uh, these spikes, they consider them noise, and they will just uh, smooth it for you. Actually, road and Schwarz is not that bad because they have a mode in which they still give you the raw data, but the display data has been smoothed. So you always see these very beautiful charts, but phase noise always has this, this spurious uh, information. So that concludes my presentation. I wanted to show a little bit how SDR could be used beyond radio frequency communication, especially digital radio frequency communication. I wanted to show how you could use readily available hardware, radio frequency oscilloscopes. I wanted to, she to show you how um, we could enable in uh, measurements that would not be feasible without uh, software-defined radio hardware. Um, and all these topics will be expanded, a bit of uh, advertisement, although there's been a plenty of it uh, during this session, during the European New Radio Days, uh, which will be held in Poitiers uh, June 22nd, 23rd. Uh, call for contribution April 1st, uh, subscription, registration is mandatory and free of charge for organization purpose and registration will be uh, deadline May 1st and the keynote speech which was given last year by Marcus on the internals of uh, 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 the scheduler of new radio this year will be given by uh, the author of uh, GNSSDR, uh, Carles Fernandez from, uh, uh, from the technical University on Communication of Catalonia uh, of Spain. So he will be giving the uh, Genesis DR is one of a heavy, uh, one of a complex software for global navigation satellite system processing heavily relying on new radio. So if you're interested, uh, OSCIM Digital was already presented, new GR oscilloscope and its 3.8 port. And for the French speaking audience, uh, you can find the details of the article in the current Linux magazine. And with that, I thank you for your attention.